Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, celebrating expression, fostering talent, and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art, and more at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, we meet an artist who collaborates with nature. We head back into the kitchen to find out how orchestral music can be found in places you wouldn't expect and hear the signature Midwest cool of a local quartet. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Holly Romano is a multidisciplined artist who uses her graphic design background and photography roots in her work. She explores alternative processes while honoring nature. We met up with her in her home studio, as well as one of her favorite inspirational spots. She shared her passion for exploring the beauty found in nature and her desire for us all to be more connected to it. I started out as a graphic designer and did that for many years and then I became a stay-at-home mom and still needed a way to be creative. I used photography as a way to document my kids' experience of COVID and the pandemic and being together all the time. And in that, I was hoping to try to find ways to still do photography but also hands-on. When I learned it in college, we still had dark rooms and film and processing, and that's just not available anymore. So I found my way into experimental photography and alternative processes. So using a lot of like instant film, vintage cameras, UV sensitive papers, manipulation techniques, things like that. I've always felt a deep connection to nature. Even as a kid, I spent many, many hours outdoors playing. And it's always been a way for me to calm down, reconnect, kind of de-stress. And doing the lumen prints with nature is kind of my way of honoring that relationship. And I feel like the prints themselves are like exposing the energy and the spirit of nature. A lot of that work relies on the weather and the plant materials. So if it's hot, if it's cold, if it's humid, how many hours of sunlight, the temperature, if the plants are fresh or dried, all of those things create different effects on the prints. And so I think of us as collaborators together, I kind of assemble everything and then nature does the rest. I try to compose depending on what kind of I'm feeling from the plants or what type of concept I'm trying to put together. I'll put the plants together on top of the paper. Sometimes I'll add maybe water or vinegar or something because I can get different effects. And then I put a piece of plexiglass over top and I clamp them together and then I place them outside. And depending on the weather, if it's a hot, sunny day, the print could take about an hour. But if it's winter and cold, that's the opposite extreme. That could take two to three days that I will leave it outside. And then I bring them in back into my dimmed basement and I take it all apart. I gotta be careful not to tear the paper. So you can see here, it created this circular kind of shadow. And these, on this paper, the lilies look almost like ghosts' petals. as kind of a like final support to nature, 
I actually don't use chemicals to process the prints like you would in traditional darkroom practice. I scan them instead on my scanner and then my digital file becomes my like final original. Sometimes if there's a piece of dirt or mulch or a bug, or maybe there was a bug on the leaf that I didn't notice and creates a empty spot, then I'll fix it at this point. Or sometimes the plant materials dry and almost adhere to the paper. So they're, I can't get them off without tearing the paper. This is where I fix those little, I don't want to call them imperfections, but and then if I want to do any color adjusting, if I want the colors more saturated or less saturated, I try to stay as true to the original. There are some instances where I have completely changed the coloring. For example, the ones that I've left out in the snow, those tend to have a blue tint because I want to honor the fact that it was winter when I made them. I heard about Art Spot from an art friend of mine, and the focus was to bring attention to the fact that while climate change and global warming feel like really big topics for people, and you think, I don't know where to begin, like that's too, too big of a topic for me to tackle, my idea was you could do something as simple as create a pollinator garden in your yard, even if you have just a few feet of square space. My display is called the Pollinators, and it's named that because I've used native Ohio plants and then also other plants that are known to attract the bees, the butterflies, the moths, and use those to make my prints along with like a circular shape which is supposed to represent earth, sun, cycles of nature. I most often will go to one of the city parks but I like to find the areas of the park that are more wild and less taken care of and manicured because I want to get a more like authentic nature experience. And I also have been known to pull over the side of the road and walk under a bridge to look at a stream or a creek and see what's under there and what plants are under there. I do a lot of experimenting. I use an app on my phone when I'm out foraging for plants to help me identify the plants, especially if I'm looking for native plants or invasive plants. I wanna know what I'm collecting and then also if I use them for a print, I want to be able to, I always write what plants I've used so that way I can keep it for my own information. So it says those are possibly fig buttercup. It all started because I cared about the planet, was trying to live more sustainable, which then led to me wanting to be outdoors, which then led to me wanting to make sure I had the right plants in my yard, which then led to me seeking out what are those plants and then finding out that those some of those things are endangered or the bees and so i thought how can i get this message out through my art also yeah i do have to consider where i'm sourcing my materials that's why i've consciously made the choice to have a lot of pollinator plants in my yard because that is at my disposal i can do whatever i want with those when I'm foraging like this out in the wild, I try to minimize my impact. So if it is a piece of bark on the ground, I'm gonna take it. Yes, I did trim some flowers today, but in my mind, the message I'm trying to get out and the impact I'm hoping to make is gonna be worth the risk that I might be taking. To see more of Holly's incredible creations, find her on Instagram at Holly Romano Artist. Now we head back into the kitchen for another Kate's Quick Bites. 
In this segment, we learn about Pro Musica and how it is redefining what it means to be a chamber orchestra. With me today is Janet Chen, CEO of Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra. Janet, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be me here. Me too. I can't wait to get started. Why don't you tell me a little something about Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra, maybe that people don't already know. Sure. Um, Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra, what I like to describe us, is a collective of 37 musicians, um, professional musicians that come from all over the country and make Columbus, their musical home. Uh, we were founded in 1979, and we have a very strong commitment to performing what we call traditional chamber orchestral repertoire, like the Mozarts, the Beethovens. But um, for our entire history, we've been very committed to bringing to life and championing new works and highlighting composers of today, because we really believe that we are the future of our genre. So uh, it's a wonderful blend of people who are really passionate about music making for this community. That's wonderful. It's such a great cultural resource for us here in Columbus. Thanks. Well, let's talk about the food. What recipe have you chosen today? So today I have chosen for us to make uh, homemade dumplings. I can't wait. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited because this um, has been a tradition um, for me growing up. Um, I grew up in Taiwan and um, dumplings symbolize uh, little pockets of treasure and, and gold. Oh, I love um, that. If you think about what the dumpling looks like. So we eat these often during the Lunar New Year. Um, if you have a birthday, it just symbolizes prosperity. But you can certainly make it at any point in time during the year. Um, it's fun to do because when you wrap the dumplings, um, you can get your kids involved, mm -hmm. you can get friends together to do it. Um, and a lot of the ingredients are really customizable to your taste. So Great. I hope we have fun. Yeah, absolutely. I like that it's kind of celebratory, but also something you can make just for your family. Absolutely. You want to. Absolutely. So what do we need to get started today? Here's what we'll need today. For the filling, one pound of ground pork, one Napa cabbage, chives, ginger, cornstarch, two tablespoons of sesame oil, two to three tablespoons of light soy sauce, dumpling wrappers, Shanghai style, and for the dipping sauce, sesame oil, chili oil, and black vinegar, or soy sauce. Okay, so we're gonna get started. What's our first step? Well, the first step is really what we'll taste at the very end mm -hmm. of after making the dumplings, but that is the dipping sauce. That's so important. Exactly. Um, what's cool about dipping sauces is, again, you can tailor however you like. Mm -hmm. So if you like spicier, not so spicy, saltier, um, sweeter, the it's sauce you. is your domain. Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. The world is your oyster when and it comes to dipping sauces. Do you kind of eyeball these based on what you know you like? I do. I eyeball it. And um, I always, the golden rule is start with less because you mm -hmm. can always add more. But for today, um, we have some chili oil. I hope you like a little Smells bit of amazing. spice. I do like the spice. Okay. Um, and we have some sesame oil, and then we have some black vinegar. So I'm not super familiar with black vinegar. Do you use this a lot? We do a lot in uh, Chinese cooking. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as punchy as soy sauce, um, and I think it provides a little bit of a little bit of tang, but it's not overwhelming. Oh, and I, I think it mixes also well with like ginger, mm -hmm. shredded ginger, and blends with the sesame oil. So I like using it. Lovely. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. how much are we, are we just adding it all and mixing it up? Yeah, let's just add it. So okay. we've got our chili oil. All right. So if you want to just... Sure, just get that. I might use this little spoon. Yeah, there. that's a good idea. Make sure we get all that goodness. Get the chili oil in. Perfect. So that's kind of the base of the and the, the heat of the sauce. It is. And you see all that nice oil yeah, around the chili flakes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we can go with the sesame oil. And sesame oil is incredibly fragrant. Okay. So um, I like to use a tiny spoon to start and just start drizzling it drizzling in. Drizzling it in, yep. Uh, and then after that, you can go with the black vinegar. Okay. And How much of this do we add? Um, let, you want the black vinegar to be a little bit more than the sesame okay. oil. Okay, we don't want to go so overboard. Maybe so a spoon, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, start there and then maybe Another. a second spoon. Yep. Okay. There you go. And then we can just mix so that all simple. together. Yep, simple. 
And if you like it to be a little more, more salty, you can add soy sauce mm -hmm. into it. Um, you can add some sugar if you like it to be sweeter, um, but that's just generally sort of the baseline. Basic dipping sauce? Yeah. Oh, looks yep. great. Okay, our beautiful dipping sauce is mixed together. Before we get started on the dumplings, tell me a little bit about how Pro Musica is redefining what it means to be a chamber orchestra. That's a great question. Um, and I think a lot of arts organizations, especially performing arts organizations, are rethinking how we're relevant to the modern world and the community. And we are in that same boat. So what we have uh, really tried to commit ourselves to is, is obviously bringing our music to the people around us. Um, we talked about commissions and new music, but also reaching those who might not have access to coming downtown, to coming to a concert. Some ways that we're doing that is uh, we created a new neighborhood series, so hour-long programs that are all around the 270 Outer Belt here in Columbus. We're also bringing musicians to local bars and breweries like Natalie's and Noctera, um, and just trying to give access to anyone who wants to dip their toes into hearing a little bit more about pro music and, and you know, spreading the joy of music. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. And I'm sure people have preconceived notions of what a chamber orchestra is. And I think it's great that you're breaking that mold. Yeah, I think, you know, often people are afraid. They don't know how to act when they come to concerts. They think maybe you have to be very polite and it's stuffy and it's really truly the opposite. And you think about the music that you hear when it was born 200 some years ago, they were playing for like, theaters where people were screaming and <laughs> throwing tomatoes or like, you we know, don't like, want oh, that, we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your tomatoes at right. home. Right. <laughs> but you know, they were living in yeah, that moment and we're recreating that mm -hmm. experience. That's amazing. So, yeah. Okay, Janet. So we're ready to assemble the dumplings. Yep. I'm so excited. I've never done this before. Uh. Is there a trick to it? Is there anything we should? Uh, there's, there's no trick. Okay. There are a couple tips yeah. that will help make the wrapping go a little easier and stick together. But, you know, some people say, oh my gosh, it's so intimidating, but you really don't have to be intimidated. Mm -hmm. Each dumpling will be wrapped with love and care <laughs> and will have its own individual identity. And I think that's what's so fun about doing this together. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got our pre-mixed, our pork mixture all yes. mixed together. So we can just start assembling. We can. All so, right, I will follow your lead. Okay. So we first take one of the dumpling wrappers, all right. just put it in the palm of your hand okay. like that. And then what we're going to first do, this is a little bowl of warm water. Mm -hmm. We're going to dip our hand in there, okay. finger, and you just want to draw a circle All the around, around the border of, and this actually acts like the glue. Okay. This so will this help it seal exactly. It will help seal it and stick together. Okay. And you can kind of feel that. Yeah, it gets a little tacky. Yep. Okay. Then we take a little spoon. Okay. Simple and, tool here. Yes. yes. You don't want to start with too much. Yeah, I bet you don't want to overfill. Yeah, you don't want to overstuff. It can always add. Just put it right in the middle. Okay. Is that That's good? Perfect. Yep. Ooh. Put that back in. And then you fold the middles, pinch it together like a taco. Okay. okay. Maybe yeah. overfilled a little. You're okay. fine. And then if you, I like to hold it like this and pinch, pinch. it on the top. Yep. Okay. Pinch the tops. And then this part, it's like a little pocket. it is, mm -hmm. you can pinch the sides. Sometimes I like to get fancy and fold oh. it on both sides if you want. That's oh, so delicate. Yes. And then yours is beautiful. <laughs> what you can do also is re-dip your finger mm -hmm. and then just seal okay. the top. Those little folds. Yeah, just make sure ideally that you don't have any gaps. Okay, um, so when, that's how they'll cook. You want that to sort of... Yeah, and you don't want the filling to kind of ooze right. out as you're cooking it. So you okay, really want to seal it. Baby. There you go. Oh my goodness. Yep. And then you just um, lay them on a floured like cookie sheet okay. um, so that they don't stick they don't together. Stick. Well, that was so much fun and yeah. not as challenging as no, I thought it would be. No, you did a great job. They're pretty they're, cute little baby dumplings. They are. They're beautiful. <laughs> so the cooking process for this, we're going to boil them. Yes. Okay, yeah. so how does that work? How long? How do you know when they're done? Yes, yeah, so today we're going to boil them because it's very simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, you can also pan fry if you would like, uh, or you can also steam them, but boiling is super easy. Okay. So we have our pot of boiling water, mm -hmm. nice and bubbly, and all we're going to do is go ahead and put the dumplings gently into into their hot bath. Yeah. Okay. 
Janet, these look amazing. Oh, uh, they turned out great. They really did, and it really is a simple process. Super simple and super yummy. I know, I'm so excited. So yeah. should, we, should we dig in Yeah, here? let's dig in. We've got okay. our dipping sauce. Dipping sauce ready. Just take one of them. Okay, come here. And they're nice and steaming. They Go to are. dip. Dip. I like to try to get all the Coat sides. In. Oh, come on, friend. Yep. Here we go. All okay. right. Go it's for not it. Be pretty. Okay. Mm. Oh my goodness. Mm, that good. flavor. You like it? Mm hmm. The sauce is such a good compliment. It is. The meat is delicious. And then the dumpling wrapper is so soft and tender. Yeah. And These it, are winners. It doesn't, the filling doesn't overpower. Right. Um, is not overpowering in flavor, so mm -hmm. the sauce really kind of helps. Yeah, absolutely. Complement that. These are wonderful. Okay, I want to get see if I can. Oh. Mm. Mm hmm. Good. Mm. I like the black vinegar. You? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's not tangy. Not too overwhelming, mm -hmm. um, but a nice balance of flavors. Mm. Thank you for coming and showing Thank us you. this beautiful recipe. No, I, it was such a treat and I think just a wonderful bonding experience. Absolutely. So. Thank you. To learn more, check out promusicacolumbus.org. Alex Burgoyne is a saxophonist, composer, and arranger. He also leads the Alex Borgoyne Quartet, which has been creating their unique sound for nearly a decade. We were fortunate to wrangle them for a Broad and High Presents session. Enjoy their signature sound that combines cool jazz, easy swing, and a few other surprising elements.
hear more of their Midwest cool, check them out at BurgoyneSax.com. Well, that's our show. With this episode, we wrap up season 10 of Broad and High. We want to say thank you to our viewers for 10 amazing years. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. We'll see you back here in the fall for new stories about art and culture in Columbus and beyond. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, celebrating expression, fostering talent, and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art, and more at columbusmakesart.com.